Thank you all for coming. Uh, I know it's a very sort of hectic time with uh, Freeze Week and, and uh, TFAF coming. So all of you are among the privileged and you have good taste that you choose to come and uh, uh, see, uh, listen to, to Anne Samad and learn a little bit about her, her work. Um, I used to be, in my previous life, among various things, I used to be curator of Southeast Asian ethnography. And one of the things that I tendentially dealt with was textile uh, for the simple reason that I was curator of metal work. And in Southeast Asia, and how it relates to to looking at Anne Samad's work in Southeast Asia, in most of the cultures, there is a kind of duality between metal and cloth, between the metal and cloth, specific, uh, especially uh, cloth made of textiles and later, you know, silk and, and supplementary uh, gold threads and, and so on. And it has to do with a kind of worldview where, you know, in important uh, points in life, such as in marriage, there will be a kind of unity of the male and the female. So metal was always hot and it was always the male and textile, thread, cloth would be cold, would be cool, sorry, and female. And in a lot of marriage ceremonies throughout Southeast Asia, you know, especially if you were from the nobility, it was very important that at a certain point there was a kind of exchange of these two things together. So even as a, a curator of metalwork and jewellery, I had to know about the other side, the other part, the other side of the coin. And when I first came upon Anne Samad's work, I was very struck by, you know, even though it clearly belongs in a contemporary idiom, that how much emotional resonance there was when the work is actually displayed to those that, that sort of understand this kind of gendered view of the world in Southeast Asia, that, you know, this exchange, you know, between metal and cloth, between metal and, and thread, uh, was not about separation, but about a kind of union. And certainly we live in an age where we need more of this kind of, of, of union and communion, uh, so to speak. So... We're very happy uh, to, on the occasion of Anne Samad's residency up in Pierskill, uh, that is fielded by the Hudson Valley MOCA, to have this conversation, which will also uh, reveal a little bit, hopefully, about you know the work that she's been doing in the residency that will culminate in a work, uh, in an exhibition, uh, which we will... Uh, tell you more about later, uh, basically, you know, a week, more than, a, slightly a week later. Um, first and foremost, uh, thank you all for coming, and especially I know some of you are members, a special thank you to all our members. I've always said this, the same litany of lines, but it's always worth saying, you are our fans, we love you. Okay, you always come, you're always in our heart, we treasure you because you, you support us with passion. You know, certainly, there's no there's no food outlet here. So evidently, you know, you're coming here before dinner. So thank you for that. We we hope to make the evening special for you, and you you go away with something. Um, just a little bit of advertisement. On May twenty third, we have a very special event: the Asia in America Next Generation uh, Party, where we celebrate uh, the the achievements of. Asian Americans, and we hope you 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 come and celebrate uh, that with us. All the information is available on our website www.asiasociety.org. Um, housekeeping: uh, Please turn off all cell phones. Put them on silent. No photography or, or recording is allowed. Uh, the program is being broadcast live. Uh, we have a, a long-standing tradition of uh, uh, live broadcast as well as many people uh, watch the program uh, after the event on in our video archive. Uh, and it will be posted within a few days on the Asia Society website. Um, and without further ado, I would just want to uh, introduce the, the two panelists and speakers for the evening. Uh, the first person that will come on is Livia Strauss, who is co-founder and board president of the Hudson Valley MOCA. If you haven't been and you live in New York, shame on you. It's only one hour away from Grand Central. 
uh, please use your Google Maps and check and go up and see and so much show. Okay. Uh, formerly known as the Hudson Valley Center for Contemporary Art, uh, Livia is an educator who has lectured widely on art and spirituality. She is currently the Professor Emeritus of Education and Jewish Religious Thought at the Academy for Jewish Religion. And she was formerly the adjunct Professor of Theology at Fordham University, among other prestigious positions. Uh, Livia Strauss has also served on the board of the Newberger Museum of Art in Purchase, New York, and the Hebrew Union College Museum in Manhattan, as well as participated in various capacities at other institutions. What she didn't put is she's a really wonderful human being. Uh, and I say this having only met her uh, recently, who really supports and really loves art. Uh, and I always say, believe it or not, not all collectors actually love art. Um, so... Uh, I think what she's done is also uh, really amazing and the fact that she is giving a residency together with her her, her husband uh, is giving a residency to an artist from Malaysia you know who is a contemporary artist that works in weaving so you see how many how many loops there are that we're talking about uh, I think that's really amazing so uh, Livia is going to give us a little bit of background particularly to the, the kind of work that is being done at the Hudson Valley MOCA which has led ultimately to this residency and, and why uh, she has chosen to work with uh, Anne Samak. So Livia, please. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, the residency program, I'll speak a little bit about the Hudson Valley, but the residency program has been a gift not just to the museum and to the artists, but of course to Mark and myself, because we get to meet people like Anne and to spend time with them and to have them really as part of our family. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> our pleasure. We want you back again and again and again. <laughs> And we have help with that, with the Asia Society. <laughs> so um, just to give you a little background, um, I'll start with this. So um, as uh, Boon mentioned, we've renamed, we've rebranded this year. Up until now, we've known as, been known as the Hudson Valley Center for Contemporary Art. You learn a lot from the very beginning as to what it's easy for people to say and not to say. HVCCA was a mouthful, so it's a lot easier now to say Hudson Valley Mocha. And it is indeed a contemporary art museum. So um, the museum itself is housed in a fairly uh, industrial-looking building. It's basically a black box or a big box um, that's a cinder block box, and you can see on the outside it says what's outside that counts, uh, done by two local artists actually from Brooklyn, as part of a large uh, festival that the museum hosts on a regular basis, the Peak Skill Project, uh, where we have one of our artists from a past Peak Skill Project here with us tonight, Lana. <laughs> um, so Hudson Valley Center for Contemporary Art, those letters are no longer there, <laughs> they've been removed. And this is our future. <clears throat> so we're looking to reface the building. We have a capital campaign going under the uh, eager guardianship of Effie Phillips, who's here tonight, who's our executive director, and the staff of the Hudson Valley MOCA, Adrian and Francesca. Uh, this is the city of Peekskill. <clears throat> so Peekskill was basically a small industrial city along the Hudson River. Uh, so the Hudson River is a beautiful geographic location, but has been a fairly depressed area um, until more recently. So many of you know Dia Beacon is now up in Beacon, New York, and uh, Hudson, New York has become a haven for a lot of artists. So that whole trail up the Hudson River now has really been revived through the arts. But this is City Hall in Peekskill. And this is the downtown. Peekskill was originally a Dutch uh, village. Uh, it was settled. The first settler there was Jan Peek. He was given uh, the territory, the property, along the Hudson River. And Peekskill was known actually originally for its production of wood-burning stoves. Um, and now has come a long way and is really known as a haven for the arts. This is the interior of the Hudson Valley Mocha. Um, our exhibitions are always international in scope. They're theme-oriented. The museum has now been in existence for uh, 16 years. 
Uh, we celebrated our 15th anniversary last year with the rebranding. And for the first time since year one, uh, the first year we opened the museum, we had an exhibition from the collection. Right now, um, the exhibition is again from our private collection. The museum itself is a Kunsthal. It does not collect art. <clears throat> This is also part of the current exhibition. This is a work by Sam Jinks. The previous work you saw was by Villa Rojas and had been on the roof of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this is a small work that was part of a, an exhibition in the upstairs, the mezzanine area of the gallery. This is by a British artist, Ange Smith. So she had her first showing in the United States at the museum and many of the artists whom we've shown have really gone on to have international reputations. This is one of our education programs. It's actually adult education and uh, youth education. And this is a poetry workshop where we're dealing with ekphrastic poetry, poets and students who come in and write poetry that intersects with works of art. More of our education programs, we now service over 4,000 children through our education programs in Peekskill. We have all of the Peekskill students now coming through uh, the museum as part of their educational initiatives. And this is a drawing class, adult education, so people, adults can come in and they can draw within the context of the art exhibition. This is the waterfront. So I mentioned before the festivals that we do on a um, usually a bi-yearly basis. Um, this is called the Peekskill Project. The sculptures you're seeing on the waterfront were all directly the result of the various Peekskill projects. So the piece on the side, the ring, basically frames the um, geology of the area. The diver on the left um, has become, it's by Carol Feuermann, has become really the uh, imagery that's used for Peekskill. So when you look up what's doing in the city of Peekskill, you will see the golden mean or the diver. And then the piece on the bottom with the beach ball is by a Korean artist, Jung Oh, who got his start at the museum in one of our graduate shows. And he won an RFP to do the sculpture on the waterfront. So an artist who usually does invisible work doing a very large size sculpture. Aside from the education programs, one of the hearts of the programs at the museum is our residency program. And we've had residents that come. The goal generally of the residency program, with few exceptions, is that we have artists from other countries because that way we build a dialogue in the community with the other artists in the community and with the members of the community in terms of the challenges facing artists in other countries, the differences in approaches to the art and the construction of the art, the cultural influences on the art that's produced, and on and on. So this is by a British artist, Chris Jones, who was very influenced in living in Peekskill by the stories that were written in the Hudson Valley, especially the stories of Washington Irving. So the story of the Headless Horseman, this is a full-size stagecoach with a headless horse, a full-size horse all made out of magazine paper and encyclopedia paper. <clears throat> this is an artist from the Netherlands, Karen Sarxian, who dealt a lot with music and art. Uh, so these are large-scale dolls that he produced out of paper, and he integrated operatic music in it. So an artist originally from Armenia and then living in the Netherlands. Korean artist, um, why did it mark? <laughs> I just lost it. This is Jin Su. So Jin Su Han, and these are all robotic machines that he produces. So this is a paintbrush that produces its paint. I have to share one story with you. So we had uh, young students come in to work with Jin Su. So these were students from a local school that's a Spanish English school, it's a bilingual school. And he was very nervous. I said, Jin Su, they're going to love you. And he said, but they're not going to be able to understand me. I said, that's why they're going to listen very quietly to see if they can understand what you're saying. And he produced these wonderful installations. They all brought bowls in that they had to fill with water. And he explained to them that in his culture, the body is like a container of water. And when you drop something into the water, the ripples create memory and history. 
So that's what the students did, and he showed them how to do robotic um, rocks that dipped into the water and then lifted and created these whirlpools. <clears throat> and this is an artist from the Czech Republic, Daniel Pitten, uh, who was working a lot with um, blueprints, old blueprints from his grandfather, collaging them and creating these beautiful collaged paintings that were also influenced by his stay in the Hudson Valley. And last but not least, Anne Samat. So we were introduced to Anne, actually by Ken Tan, who um, was very excited by her work. Ken is a close friend and my husband's partner in the gallery. Um, and he was very excited when he saw Anne's work. And he said he met her and she's lovely and we should bring her to Peekskill and let her do a residency. And um, Anne came to us almost three months ago. Uh, she's living in Peekskill in a beautiful studio that is shared by a wonderful, very, very kind, very generous, and very community um, active artist in Peekskill, Lana Yu, uh, who was so excited by having Lana come, by having um, Anne come. And of course, Anne arrived exhausted. <laughs> A little sick, <laughs> needed some tender, loving care, and thank goodness Lana was there to really serve as, as a sister and as, as somebody who really cares. Um, so this is Anne in her studio. You can see it's a beautiful studio. Peekskill has uh, artist live work spaces that were federally subsidized. And um, many of the artists who were lucky enough to get in at the beginning have these exquisite live work spaces. Uh, and uh, not a lot, but some of them, like Yan Lana, agree to host some of our artists in residence. And of course, in spite of the two cats, we have <laughs> Anne working with all this fiber. <clears throat> so Anne's show will be coming up at the museum, opening on May 9th. Uh, I asked Anne for a few pieces of, a few images of earlier work that she produced so that we could get a feel for the whole breadth of her work. So this is Anne in front of a loom doing her original weavings that were really quite gorgeous. Um, so this is a close-up of one of the weavings that she had done. It was a framed weaving and more from a distance. You can see the integration of the beading in it. And uh, Anne and I had the, the delight to go into one of the local cra craft shops where we were surrounded by all these wool and all these beads. It was a great experience. This is like an exquisite piece, the Alpha and Omega, the folding of the woven materials and the colors uh, that are used in it. This with the beading on the bottom. And this. So, you know, working with an artist in resident like Anne, Mark and I were just in Brussels, and we went into this one artist's um, space, uh, not an artist's space, a collector's space, an exquisite space. And we said, oh, you have to see the work of this wonderful artist in residence that we have in Samat. She said, I know Anne. I love Anne, right? So we got into this whole conversation, and lo and behold, she had one of Anne's pieces hanging in her installation. But this is Anne in her studio. Um, I still remember when we went into Home Depot the first time and she saw these huge wall size rakes and it was like, wow, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> so Anne again. And these are the types of weavings, the types of wools that are available um, in this shop that we found in AC Moore. So I think Anne is on the, the AC Moore love list <laughs> for the rest of her life, whether she comes, stays here or goes back. And these are some close-ups of the works that are being produced for the exhibition on May 9th that will be opening. And this is the initial part of the installation at the museum, and it is exquisite. So I think that um, the goal of the residency is always to give the artist time Focus time, not to have to worry about a lot of other things, just to focus on their work. And to know that the goal is that at the end there's going to be a major solo exhibition. And there will be coverage and there will be people visiting it and that there will be exposure to the general community in terms of the arts. So I hope many of you will join us on May 9th 
up at the Hudson Valley Center for Contemporary Art to celebrate the opening. If you can't make it up May 9th, <laughs> if you can't make it up to the opening, then come afterwards. <laughs> We're open during the week. We're open from Wednesdays through Sundays. So please join us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Start from the beginning. Okay, let's sure, talk about let's, do uh, it. let's talk about, <laughs> about weaving. Yeah. I mean you 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 are quite unique in the sense that you actually when when we say you, you started as a weaver, you mm. literally studied, like in school, sure. uh, yeah. traditional weaving, traditional Malaysian mm. Uh, mm. weaving. Mm. Uh, can I ask why you started that? And then what was the experience? I mean, what was the purpose of that, okay. that, that school? Was it literally to produce, you know, traditional weavers? Uh, or? Yeah, I, I'm actually from... Um uh, University Technology Mara, which mm. is, is based in Selangor, Malaysia. Mm. And of course, when we talk about, you know, School of Art and Design, you have, uh, you know, I have a few choices, which mm. is I can go straight to study fine art, mm. ceramic, fine metal, graphic, which is quite popular during my time, mm. or textile. Mm. And I know from the very beginning that when I joined that university, what I really want to do is I want to do something different, something that I have zero knowledge of mm. it. So in a way of graphic design, in a way of fine art, which is I love it, but the thing is I said, okay, there's a lot of people out there, you know, into that uh, department. So yeah. I said, let's try something different, which is textile which is, again, when we talk about textile, we have printing, we have um, batik or ikat or resist, I think, in the international world, they call it yes. resist, yes. right? And I said, okay, that's quite interesting, but what is the thing that really uh, caught my attention by that time is actually the weaving, mm. which is, I said, I got, no, I got zero knowledge about it, and I think it is a right time for me to do something different. Some, it is for me to challenge myself, mm. you know, to learn something that I don't know, to learn something that I feel that I can challenge myself, you know, to, to see where I can go. Don't ask me what is going to be, how I'm going to be or what I'm going to be in the future. But that's the thing for me, the best part is mm. the challenge that I, to the unknown path, to the unknown journey mm -hmm. that make me into it. Yes. And in our yeah. previous conversations, I think that theme comes out a lot <laughs> as to why why you make certain artistic choices in yeah, time yeah. and a lot of it has to do with you challenging yourself Indeed, to go yeah. into an area that that you have not been mm, that mm. that that's not the that's yeah. not the barrier actually that's the inducement to to go there exactly that is actually the way that i look at it it is the opportunity for me to actually uh to Again, as I said, to challenge my, myself to see how far I can go. Mm. You know? So you started off, as Livia has said so beautifully, you know, with literally the traditional loom. Sure. You know, and, and, and what the traditional loom does is produce flat. I mean, literally. Two-dimensional fabric. Two-dimensional exactly. fabric, which mm. a lot of it is meant for the body. Some of it may be ceremonial hangings. Sure. But literally, it's two-dimensional. So, you know, these earlier, very uh, exquisite, sort of uh, works, yeah. uh, wall pieces, yeah, that, that I, I think you call them. But already by this time, I mean, these are not really traditional weaving, right? Yeah. Because yeah. the patterning and the motif is, even the colour scheme is departing quite drastically. On top of that is the materials as well. Yes. I mean, from the very beginning, from the early stage, yes. you know, I decided when I look at the loom, I said what I really wanted to do is I want to learn the basic technique, mm. how to handle that traditional loom. Mm. But I know from the very beginning that what I wanted to do is I want to produce something different. That's mm. the reason why even though you see yes. from my earliest work, it's already started to become a three-dimensional thing. Yeah. yeah, but it's actually based, the technique, everything is based on the traditional technique. Yes, yeah. and what kind of material were you using in this uh, from oh uh, yeah back then even the, from the university yes. a lot of weavers i mean if you talk about weavers in general we are not talking about just in malaysia we are mm. if we are talking if we talk about the weavers all around the world 
normally they will use thread as a warp yes. and thread as a weft. But again, I'm still maintaining that uh, thread as a warp, but I give a twist by using the rattan stick, which mm. is I hand painted everything, mm. every single stick. I'm actually hand painted it. That's why you can see that's colorful over there, all the, all the color weft. So instead of using the thread as a, a weft, I give a big twist using the rattan stick. Mm. So from there, you can create the, the dimension. You can, mm. you can create thicker layers or thicker base of the work, which is mm. in, creates more interesting, mm. more dimension to the work mm. itself. I mean, when I first, the first time I saw these, <laughs> sure. these things, it, the first thing that occurred to me was, really, you, you are sort of interjecting, interrupting. You, <laughs> yeah. know? you, yeah. you are deliberately you know, disrupting this normal yeah. flat surface because the weave goes this way, right? Mm. But you know, what she does is suddenly you are, you are sort of disrupting that by inserting that. And, and that is a very, I mean, to me, that's a very contemporary sure. gesture sure. that you, you are sort of you know, inserting a foreign it, element that is actually foreign to this tradition exactly, into, yeah. into this... this, this uh, this weave that you you have, you know, mm. and bizarrely now the first thing that came to my mind years ago was, oh, this is like John Cage <laughs> in prepared piano, <laughs> suddenly deciding, you know, I'm gonna like insert that, I don't know, yeah. that book into, you know, uh, the, the piano string. Yeah, you know? That I, was the first I, thing that came to mind. Even, I got a story of it as well, because my lecturer, when, yeah. I, when I, I remember that I went to his office, and I said, what shall I do for my uh, thesis, for my, for my final semester? Mm. And then he said, you know what, And I don't know what to do with you. You just <laughs> do whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I think back then, again, as I said, that a lot of uh, my friends or, you know, the rest of the weavers, they're still following, you know, they follow the traditional way of doing mm. it. But I said, no, I'm not going to do it. From the very beginning, I said, I decided that if I want to do something, I might as well do something that, you know, first and foremost, that make me happy and make me feel satisfied about it. Yeah. So that's why even my lecturer said, y you know, you just do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I got A for my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> You have a very, very open-minded yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> lecturer. So, can I ask you, the, at what point did the text, the weave, come off the wall? Ah, mm -hmm. okay, that's because that's that's to me that's the second <coughs> kind of radical move. You know, yeah, the weave yeah, coming off the wall. Well, okay, that's a very good question. Yeah. Actually, you've seen before the alpha and omega, which is actually is mounted on the wall on the. Um, wood panel and then exactly this one and then you uh, put it on the wall and then I'm thinking you know after a few years I was thinking like I got enough of it yeah. it's like your mom asks you to eat chicken every day so you're gonna get sick of it isn't it you feel like you want to <laughs> eat something else so that's happened to me as well I was thinking like okay that's nice but I really want to do something that I really I want to again I want to challenge myself What's next? Mm. So I'm thinking the, the next thing that I'm going to do, the next series that I'm going to come out with, is definitely has to be the opposite of Alpha and Omega. Mm. That is where, you know, when you said about the unconventional materials mm. like rakes, mm. you know, um, um, whatever right. you can see on that. Exactly. Rakes, and then you can see belts, and then they have garden utensil, kitchen utensil. I said, whatever I want to do with my new series is definitely going to be the opposite than the Alpha and Omega. So that means if Alpha and Omega just be on the wall and the material is, is maybe two, three different materials, I said, my next series is totally going to be the opposite. You know, the size definitely going to be bigger. The material is going to be more like... Um, bazaar I think mm. so mm -hmm. and in a way you know it's sort of like again as I said that if Alpha, Alpha and Omega is night I want to do the opposite the new series must be daylight mm. or if it is black the other series must be white but were you conscious that with the move of the work off the wall uh -huh. that that um, you know 
suddenly the work is now experienced as literally sculpture most of the time. Indeed, Rather, yeah. I mean, that's another step away from how one would contemplate textile or sure. woven art. Sure, you know? sure. And that's, that's, I think that's the best part of it because even though I try to uh, create something uh, different than the mm. previous series, mm. but the DNA of it you still can trace. The mm. original weaving process techniques is actually, if you look at it carefully, mm. is still there. The mm. DNA is still there. So mm. that's why, you know, even though you can't really see it from the picture, that's why you guys have to come on the 9th of May, <laughs> yeah, to witness that thing. And then you can see what, uh, what we are discussing today. Mm. So, yeah. But However. why, why <laughs> I mean, there's the work coming off the wall, but uh -huh. also you were talking about why do you choose to use household, common utilitarian objects yeah. in which to, you know, anchor your weaves? I, I found that it is quite, it is quite um, sad because this kind of material, we normally just overlooked, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like, Okay, what is the purpose of the rake, for instance? Yes. You just do it as that purpose and that's it. Mm. And I'm thinking like, that's a shame. I mean, why don't I come up with something? Mm. And if I talk to other artists about mm. it, they're probably going to look at me like, are you out of your mind? And mm. But for me, that out of your mind is a nice thing for me. I take it as a challenge, mm. not, not to prove they are wrong. Mm. But to prove to myself, hey, you know what? People say it's quite impossible to do something yeah. with this kind of cheap, unconventional materials. Yeah. But it's also, I think, I mean, within I mean, contemporary art discourse, it's also very much, there is a kind of resonance, I suppose, or empathy mm. with the desire, of, of course, weaving yeah. as, traditional, mm. uh, as a traditional practice is very much in Southeast Asia associated with women, mm. you mm. know, with, with literally a marginalized segment of the population. And similarly, they are very important because literally women weave the clothes you wear on. Yeah, you know, they, they are doing all these things. But Aside from that, you know, they, they, are com they, are, they, they are, in a sense, the more marginalised part of traditional, of a lot of Southeast Asian society. Well, a lot of societies just in general. Mm. So mm. just like these household items that you use, they are utilitarian. They do, you know, they clear leaves, you know, you prepare food sure. with them, you clean the house, but that's it. You just, you don't yeah. think much of them. I think what's interesting about your work is the collision, the, the, the sort of correspondence between these two exactly. very functional things that we often take for granted. And, and what you seem to have done is to have, you know, one, made us all look at them <laughs> yeah, and yeah. look at them in a kind of, gee, I didn't know you could use a rake in that. <laughs> In that way, yeah. and and, yeah. and and like, how many of you would have thought that is it possible to weave a, a broom, <laughs> like literally, uh, sort of weave a blue a broom? I, I think that's really sort of interesting, mm. uh, in that sense. Sure. So I want to go back to to uh, the residency, uh, the residency, and and to say a, to for both of you to comment a little bit about what I I know Livia said a little bit about. Uh, you know the purpose of the residency, but what was, what what was different about the the residency, and and how has that sort of you know changed the work that we are going to see? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I must I must say this. Um, I enjoy very much. I mean, it's 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 amazing experience to do the residency with Lana, of course, over there. She helped me a lot, and. Um, and then, um, you know, the first thing that I learned out of, you know, from this residency is how to use a drill. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to use a drill. I don't even know that thing. And I mentioned to her, I said, what the heck is that? And she says, that's a drill. And I said, and how to use that? And she taught me how to use the drill. And then normally back home, I have people that help me out how mm. to assemble the rakes. Mm to put the structure together. And mm. then after that, I will weave mm. in between of everything. Mm. But, you know, now, uh, one of the best thing that I learned, the experience that I learned from here is mm. I learned how to use the drill and I learned how to put the work together. Mm. And I think that's very, very 
um, for me, that's very important for me to, to learn how to do it. Mm. And I have to learn uh, from there as well. I, um, you know, I learned to create more um, uh, intricate work yeah. or, or by using intricate materials such as different type of yarn. Yeah. I think yeah. one thing that's very visible, I mean, what that's you say, huge. you know, what it meant is the, the kind of complexity of the work yeah, you know now that you are, you you, well, I wouldn't say learn a new skill. No. <laughs> you, skill. you are exploring a certain kind of way of putting together the work. The is that the kind of three dimensionality of the work, particularly the one on the right? Yeah. I think that that is a kind of new uh, thing. Yeah. But I want to talk also about the yarn uh, because we, oh, we yeah. yeah we saw. I mean, I didn't realize that that actually. Uh, as a person who does not weave, as a person who does not weave, I mistakenly thought that these uh, these threads, for example, are just threads. Uh, but actually, they are more like yarns. They are actually composed of different threads, and that you actually make each yarn yeah. out of different threads. Could you say a little bit about what you do and what you did here in New uh, York? Yeah. Is is something that I learned from here is, um, you know, we have you guys have a lot of choices when it comes to yarn. I know yeah. probably some people don't understand that, but the thing is, back home, I have pretty uh, limited um, type of yarns that I can work with. But when I got here, like Livia said just now, when we went to AC Mall, I went bonkers. <laughs> it's because of the yarns over there. It's sort of like you put a girl in a shoe shop. You, know, <coughs> that you go crazy about it. And uh, the thing that I learned is because from that different type of yarns that you can get it from here, mm. you can create more different type of yarns on top of that. Mm. You know, that means as long as you know the techniques, like I know how to do it, mm. and on top of that, because <coughs> of the quality of the yarns is totally different, I managed to create different type of yarns on top of different type of yarns. So in a way, like I give birth to a new to a new yarns, which is I found it's quite interesting myself. So, so what Anne is talking about, if you look at this uh, photo, you can see what we see as threads when you see it in close up. It's actually made out of different kinds of threads, and they are they are manually made. I mean, she literally <laughs> knots or yeah. plates. Or I don't know what is the term <laughs> yeah. for that. Each of them together, and uh, the fact that different threads have different weights. Some are a bit tighter. Some are a bit looser. You know, some a bit thicker, some a bit thinner. Sure. It's actually very difficult to knot them together. Mm. Uh, you can try that at home. It's <laughs> actually, you take different uh, threads. It's very difficult to knot them together consistently. So I think that's a kind of that's the very time-consuming part. But also, it's a kind of of skill, and there's a lot of artistic judgment sure. yeah. because you don't. There's some variability, as Anne was saying in. In, in in each of the threads, sure. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like this. So how do you make that choice of what <laughs> to combine? Well, it's, it's, it's actually based on colour. So mm. no matter what, I think like the rest of the artists yes. or painters, they yes. will choose the colour first. Livia, like when we went to... It was to amazing. The, it was, <laughs> we went yeah. to the shop. She said, if I put like, three things together, I'll get this colour. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Like yeah. at vision. first, I'm not sure whether Livia understood that. By the mm, end of the day, no. she said, OK, girl, yeah, I got it. Because <laughs> I said, OK, Livia, I want to get white. But I want, you need to help me to find three or four whites yes. together. Right. Yes. So that from that three or four whites, yes. and then I can just put it together as one. So in a way, it's not only a, a learning process for me, but it's a mm. learning process for, it's learning process for no, both of us. amazing. Mm. Yeah. Because really it was like painting. It was like painting mm. with the yarn. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Could you, you know, to watch an artist do that, you come in and, and you know, Anne already had an idea as to what the coloration had to be in a particular area of the sculpture. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. you know, looking at the way she looked at the work and she said, look, if I twist these three together, I get this color. Yes. Now, how can you do that with yarn? It's three different colors. Yes. And yeah. it's not like a painting, but it is. Exactly. But it exactly. is. And again, it's, actually, it's very interesting. It's because of the choices that we have over here. Yes. It's actually open 
another another uh, dimension of creativity in in my head that it is possible to do it. Yes. Which is is very that is something that I can't achieve back home because I don't have the materials. Yeah. I don't have enough enough texture yarns yeah. back home. Yeah. So in a sense, the work that we will see uh, up in 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 in. in uh, Hudson Valley, you know, the, the the materials is also very indigenous to this uh-huh. uh, location, you know, so the, the overall look, I mean, the density, visual density is much heavier. You know, I, just to um, talk to that, I mean, mm. one of the things that I find amazing, you know, you have ants coming from Malaysia, it's a different yes. culture, um, you would think a different sensitivity uh-huh. in terms of the art. But the types of materials she's integrating, yes. and for me, this is you know kind of the the segue from art that's specific to a culture yes. to art that becomes universal. The materials she's integrating are universal materials. Mm. So when she starts working with the pots, the pans, you know, the things, the the strainers from the kitchen, or the rake, she's talking to the way I leave, mm. I live, and each of the pieces has a memory. You know, once you use an object in your kitchen or you use it in your backyard. It has the memory of what you've done with it. Mm. And for me, the works are, what makes them so special is that they do have this very universal voice. Mm. Uh, Would you now, maybe, could you say a little bit about the the five pieces that you made for the residency? Because there is a, you know, this, yeah, there is a kind of theme. There is a particular kind of narrative that (coughs) you're talking about. Okay. Um, The theme is actually based, um, you know, it's 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 about my family. And uh, sorry, I um, when 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 they offer me to be to come here, I I I. You know, I I almost said no. It's because because my mother just passed away when they offered me the residency. So it's pretty difficult for me to to be here alone. You know, I I know nobody nobody in, in in New York. So I spoke to my to my baby brother, and then he said, just just go, just go. But I just said that. I, I don't know what to do. I have, I have, you know, because I'm still sad because my my mother passed away a few months after that. So my my baby brother said, "Hey, you know what? Use use this, the the sadness that you're going through now and create as a theme." So that's the reason why that when you you look at the work in the museum, it's actually based um, on my family. So the one that you see on the on the far right is actually my mother. So that, that size is really big, it's about 10 feet high and it's about seven feet, um, the width is about seven feet. So it's actually the love that we have among us, you know, that, that's the thing that for me, the most important thing that my mother gave it to us is actually the love. And so that's the reason why that the whole body of work is based on my family and that's the reason why the title is the greatest love. Mm. Yeah. So that and of is, course, the mother figure is the largest. It's the largest. She's the, the most queen. Majestic, uh, She's the queen. Figure here. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. it's at the same time a very personal sure. kind of series for you, right? It's yeah. Kind of it's not something a kind that of celebration I just celebration of your family. It's not something that I just imagine. Yeah. It's like from the previous series. It's something that you know I put the creativity, the imagination into it. Mm. But this body of work is really come up from my heart. From you, you know, it's because of the love that we have mm. between us. Mm. So it meant a lot for me. Mm. Great, <laughs> big, big yeah. time. Sorry. So going back again, so Livia, like with the residency program, what I mean, you've you've done it for for quite some time. What is the what is uh, you know what has the experience of artists in general? Been, and especially with regard to, you know, mm. what do you see with the work that comes out at the end of that residency? 
I think that the, as I mentioned before, the residency gives the opportunity for the artist just to focus on the work, mm. to kind of set life aside. Yes. And just to know that they're going to have an opportunity to showcase what they produce. I think for me, the, um, you know, residencies, different residencies offer a lot of different things. But the fact that there's a goal, that in the end there's going to be a sharing with the world mm. of what you produce, helps the artist to grow. And then the fact that there's this kind of space yes. to explore things lets them think bigger. Mm. And when you, you was, know, could you say a little bit about what, what does think you know, bigger mean? Well, bigger in terms of the size of the works they're producing. Um, I mean, Anne's work, Chris Jones, when he came from London, he was making these small pieces. Mm. All of a sudden, he's got this huge stagecoach and a horse. Mm. Anne has this big mother who's mm. kind of hovering over the space. Mm. I think that um, the greatest gift I think we can give an artist is that the artist can grow. Uh, that they have that opportunity to kind of spread their wings and yes. not worry about what's going on around them. Yes. Um, to kind of leave responsibility aside for a while. And uh, the artists we've worked with have benefited from that. Um, they've taken advantage mm -hmm. of that opportunity. And it's interesting because Peekskill is not, it's not in Manhattan. And you would say, well, why would an artist do a residency not in Manhattan, specifically an hour north of Manhattan? Well, you still have access to the city. Yes. But you have that protection of being in a smaller community, of, of not walking on the street and kind of being bombarded mm. by a lot of noise and a lot of things going on. Mm. To have that time to be uh, a little bit um, introvertive, to, to meditate a bit to be able to have the breathing time to just look at the work, mm. uh, to be surrounded by trees, mm. to be near the river. That's impacted on people a lot, mm. on the artists a lot, mm. just to have that geographic location. And you, you spoke about, <clears throat> you know, an artist community in, in, in Pierre Skill. Yeah. So how has the, the artists in the residency or the residency itself interacted with that, that community so over the years? So it's varied from artist to artist. Um, you know, we've had artists that have done series of lectures that have gone to local universities. It all depends on the artist because mm. the concern is mainly that the artists feel comfortable with what they're doing. Mm. And uh, if the artist feels tense because they don't feel like they don't have time to complete their work, then we have to pull back at the museum oh. and let them have that time. Anne has made friends in the community mm. and people who really love her. Mm. I, I, there's no other word for it. She uses the word love, and she has. She's endeared herself enormously to the community. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, it's she's mentioned uh, Lana a few times. Uh, Lana has brought other artists to meet her. Yeah. Um, she comes into the museum, and as I say, it's like, oh, Anne's here. <laughs> you know, everybody says yeah. so, Anne's here. So um, I think being able to make those close you know, relationships to know that you have those relationships to come back to. Yes. You know that you really have friends on the other side of the world. And the opportunity for artists who live in Peekskill, it is a very large arts community, for them to be able to come in and to see an exhibition to the, like this, to know that it was produced in the city. Mm. And because of Anne's work, to be able to look at it and to say, oh, I recognize those things. You know, I know, you know, I use those things. I know those things. I know where she got them. You know, it's like um, it creates a, a wonderful dialogue. And, you know, in terms of the end factor, many of the artists who have come through the museum have gone on to very successful careers. And I think part of it is that they have had that space to grow. Mm. You know, you leave art school and you're thrown into the world and you have to produce work. And how does an artist make that space to be able to draw back for a little while and just think and just create? Mm. And I think that's what, that's what Anne's done. <laughs> so now going back to Anne on picking up that point. So yeah. what, what do you 
I mean, when you were here, aside from learning how to drill, but yeah. as an artist, yeah. <laughs> but as an artist, <laughs> as an artist, you know what? What do you feel in terms of your practice? You will take away mm. when you go back to to Malaysia to future kind of projects. Yeah, uh, what I really want to do uh, for the for my future work is actually try to bring um, instead of put it against the wall. I want to make it more three-dimensional, which mm. is off the wall. Mm. So it's more like a real sculpture where mm. everybody can walk around 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. I think that is something that I want to, um, you know, again, I want to challenge myself to bring it out to mm. that, from mm. two-dimensional to three-dimensional. Mm. And that is, yeah. like, I suppose, really very far away from the days of the loom. Oh, yeah, definitely. Weavings, uh, you know, as a flat. I yeah, know. definitely, but still have my DNA, my signature in, mm. in it, which is the weaving, mm -hmm. the traditional way of weaving. It's just the way of presenting is going yes. to be different. Yes. Yeah, but the DNA of the work is still going mm. to be the same. So what do you actually, it sounds very obvious, but I think it's worth saying. So what do you, do you feel uh, that audiences or, or people who, who look at the work mm -hmm. and they realise that, you know, it's woven together, literally. I mm -hmm. mean, all these disparate objects are woven together and it becomes the act of weaving, turns it, transforms it into something else mm. other than, you know, a piece of, of woven textile. What do you think, uh, you know, what, or rather, what are you hoping uh, that, that people t take away with regard to... I mean, in Malaysia, in Southeast Asia, it's a really traditional... It's really, of course. It's really just a part of our life. Yeah. You know, many women, you will know what is weaving. Yeah. If you're really, really, uh, you know, from an old household, you will learn somehow a little bit, mm. you know, of what it is and so on. What, but it's, it's, a, it's a dying tradition. Yeah. In terms yeah. of people practicing yeah. that, right? Yeah. So do you feel that your, your work is sort of, in a sense, also trying to recast that that tradition? In a way, it is. I think it's very important. I mean, back home, especially in Malaysia, mm. I think for the time being, I'm probably the only one mm. that... Um, there are a lot of weavers everywhere, yes. but I am the only one that using that traditional way of weaving mm. and bring it to the next level. Mm. So I think it is very important for me, myself, as an artist, mm to not try to influence, you know, like what I discussed with Lana this <coughs> morning, a part of, of, of to, to be an artist is not to teach people, is to inspire them, to inspire mm -hmm. them. So that is what, for me, is important if they look at my work. Yes. It's for them to get some inspirations and maybe just can use whatever traditional technique that they know in terms of craft, in terms of artwork, and try to challenge themselves to bring it to the next mm. level. But why should we even care about this tradition? Yeah, I think it's very important, though. It mm. is very, very important. It's, it's because I believe that, you know, the thing that make the nation of the country strong mm. is not because of the strength of the armies of the soldiers, it's mm. because of the culture. Mm. So that's the reason why that we need to preserve and we need to bring this thing out and yeah. especially teaching it and sharing it with the new generation, with the young, younger generation, because that's the thing. The culture actually makes the country strong or mm. stronger. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So your, your work, I mean, literally, it's, 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 it's trying to take you know, what is a very traditional and unfortunately declining Yeah, of practice, course, even in Malaysia. Yeah, even putting it in, in, Malaysia, in the language like of contemporary sculpture, of contemporary sort of installation. Mm. You know, I, I think that, that is, seems to be, to me, the, the core of uh, the practice. Sure. So we certainly look forward uh, to going up to see uh, the show, uh, if Please. not at the opening, but uh, all the way till, till uh, September. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, okay, ladies. First. I, <laughs> I, um, when I look at your work, uh -huh. it, um, it sort of looks like a mask to me. So yeah. there's uh, an element of what this gentleman was talking about, uh, you know, the sort of European tapestry uh, 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 that there's one functionality of that, but there's also, but 
there's a sort of a mask quality to yeah. them. And yeah. so I was just sort of curious about, um, you know, because the, the lecture is about gender mm. and combinations of gender. Mm. Mm. And what does that mean in your art? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand that. Yeah. I mean, when I produce my work, it's always like, um, you know, it must be a male or female, husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend. So that's the reason why that for me is when I produce it, it's always like when we talk about those relationships, men and female or boyfriend and girlfriend, it's all based on, of, you know, it's based on love. So it's always love involved in that kind of thing, in that kind of when I produce the work like that. So the, the, the imagery of male or female there is if you look at it, if you come to the gallery or the museum, you can see it pretty clearly. So this is, you can define this is male and this is the female part. Yeah. But they are also very, by, by this series of work, it's also quite, tot almost like totems yeah, yeah, already, in a way, right? Yes, there yes. Are, that's where the link with, with I think, uh, mask and all mm, that is, because mm. it's very totemic. They are yes. almost, uh, I think your work seems to have become much more also anthropomorphic at a certain level sure, as, it, yeah. as it started to move further and further away from from flat pictorial dis sure. depictions yeah, yeah. You know, of figures. In fact, I would say your earlier work was much more, I, for want of a better word, abstract yeah, than sure. your later yeah, work. That, yeah. that it, as it becomes more totemic, uh, as you were saying, you know, it becomes much more about a uh, kind of physicalization of human sure. relationships yeah. As, yeah. as tied together by mm. gender, mm. which mm. is why it becomes, you know, this kind of shape. Whereas if you look at the earlier work, uh, it's much more abstract form, yeah. abstract pattern, yeah. of course. Yeah. It, no, there is no, no, no there's no. definitely yeah. no. Yeah. So it goes, so it's, it's, that's a kind of major uh, transformation. Yeah. Mm. But I think we also have to understand, as, as mentioned in the beginning, that the context of weaving in which Anne comes from, weaving itself is very, very gendered. Uh, the men cannot weave. Mm. They will do yeah. the the only time men traditionally touch textile is dirty work. That means the men dye the indigo, no. the <laughs> dirty yeah. But the rake yes. Is a symbol of yes. Male work. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. The yes. The duality of the yes. yeah, exactly. So that that tension always is behind. Mm -hmm. Anybody else in this? Somebody was on it. Okay. Um, first, uh, thank you so much, and thank you for sharing the, sure. your story. And um, you know, it's incredibly moving and generous of you to thank share you. that. And it um, it kind of made the the figurative <coughs> aspect. It explained <coughs> the figurative aspect of these new pieces, which I was going to ask you about um, if you hadn't said that. Um, one of the things I see most distinctly in all of your um, work here, though, is there is this interesting play between mass-produced materials mm. and your hand kind of innovating in its way with them. And sure. I feel like that's a really important part of this conversation, especially as, you know, Malaysia and the entire world, it has really shifted its economy and its emphasis you know, toward that, sure. and um, what we think of as traditional is yeah. having to be redefined, and th and craft has to be redefined in that context. So it's very inventive and ingenious, and you know, I love sort of the the gaudy color and the weird. You know, you <laughs> see little bits of plastic everywhere, and just the idea of the of adapt, yeah, <laughs> adapting the um, the rakes to that. One of the things I was going to ask you is, um, you know, clearly like the weaving itself is a reference to tradition mm -hmm. and, and your particular country's traditions and that kind of horizontal and the grid. Yes. In the way that you're using those rakes and setting up the figurative image, does that also refer visually or emblematically to any particular traditional imagery 
Indeed, yeah, that actually is a very good question. That one, it's it's actually based in the ethnic group from my country, and the the we have thirteen states in Malaysia. So basically, the 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 image or the shape of my work is actually based、um, on the motif that we have in Sarawak, which is based on the traditional、uh, tribal chief design. So the, so the shape of it is actually. Um, the、uh, stylization of the tribal chief from that ethnic group from my country, so that's the reason why that you can see that kind of sort of like a very、um, you know, like warrior look shape. Yeah. Yeah. So the works yeah. in yeah, it's very like obvious.、That. Especially、yeah. the blue one, you can see on the blue one that kind of shape. Yeah. Yeah, and the blue one is the one that has the swords, right? Yes, yes,、yeah. that's the one、yeah. that got swords. Yeah. yeah. So it's very uh, what uh, Anne is reading is very specific. So she's talking about Sarawak, Sarawak tribe,、mm. uh, like indigenous culture. Yeah, exactly, the ethnic、uh, group. Yeah, which is very similar to what you find in Indonesia. In, in exactly, in、Thailand. everywhere, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Hence the reference to you know almost like totems like that. Yeah.、Mm. Any more questions? Okay. Oh, we're running. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late. Yeah.、Uh, if yeah. not,、uh, we'd like to again. It's bear <laughs> showing again and again. Please go to Pierce Skill. There's nothing like <laughs> the the sculptures are extremely complex, and the you really have to go up close to see them to realize how. Complex they are, and and as this lady in front mentioned, you know, it it's actually quite suggestive,、uh, even as a viewer,、uh, the juxtaposition of the materials and the way、uh, these very common utilitarian,、mm. mass-produced, man-made materials are sort of very painstakingly stitched together, <coughs> you know, and、yeah. and and, and、uh, you know they're very emotional work. So I highly encourage you. Uh, to go and and see them because I think also with Anne's work you are reaching a kind of area, you know, in in contemporary art that is very you're almost at a loss for words because there is a kind of your your concepts start to become very fluid. You know, things are bleeding to each other and there's a kind of emotional pull,、mm, sure. pull and pull that it's very difficult to say this means that that means、mm-hmm. that, but. It's it's a kind of the the sensation of the、mm. the totality is very very、really, strong. Yeah, you know? there's a majestic presence. Yeah, when you stand in front of the works, there really it's a powerful presence physically,、yeah. as well as emotionally. Yeah. Before so, you notice yeah, that there that, is a rake,、yeah. exactly. actually, when you actually right, stand、exactly. in the photograph, it's slightly different. But when you actually look at the work. You know, and the thread、yeah. mm. work. It's 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 a you know, it's quite emotional. Highly encourage you all to see that. So have a good evening. Thank you all for coming. Go see the show. <laughs> <laughs>